Hello, and thanks for joining. My name is Derek King, and today we're going to talk about clustering approaches and techniques. This presentation is just one presentation in a broader series of presentations diving into topics of data mining, machine learning, and predictive analytics. If you're interested in those topics, please feel free to check out the other uh, presentations. All right, let's begin. The overview of topics that we're going to talk about today is an introduction to clustering techniques. We're going to talk about the k-means cluster, hierarchical clustering, and we'll also talk about a Gaussian mixed model. We'll get into some visualizations of the distance matrix, and then we'll jump into a practical example. Cluster analysis, or clustering, is the task of grouping a set of objects in such a way that objects in the same group, and we'll call them a cluster, are more similar, in some sense or another, to each other than those in other groups or other clusters. It is a main task of exploratory data mining and a common technique for statistical data analysis used in many fields, including machine learning, pattern recognition, image analysis, information retrieval, and bioinformatics. So essentially what we're trying to do here is we're trying to find observations or data points or rows, however you want to look at it, that contain features that are similar to other observations in the data set. And what's important about this is that the data set, these relationships aren't already pre-known. There is no hierarchy or classification that's already assigned to an item. So just through attributes of the data, we're going to say, aha, put all of these pieces together in a unique cluster. And cluster analysis itself is not one specific algorithm, but it's the general task to be solved. In this case, it's the clustering task. Okay, and there's many techniques and approaches that can be combined uh, to help with this. There are many real-world applications of clustering, grouping or hierarchies of products, as we, we talked about, you know, finding attributes of products and bundling them together and calling them a, 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 a superset, if you will. Recommendation engines. So if I can cluster certain types of customers together, based off of their buying habits in certain products, then I can create recommendation algorithm or recommendation engines using the a priori algorithm or market task analysis. So this technique is actually used in combination with other machine learning and predictive analytics techniques to create more powerful algorithms. We can use this for biological classification exercises. Uh, typologies. It's very useful in crime analysis, medical imaging, market research, social network analysis, and Markov chain Monte Carlo methods. According to Vladimir Estevol Castro, the notion of a cluster cannot be precisely defined which is one of the reasons why there are so many different clustering algorithms out there. There is no objectively correct clustering algorithm, but as it was noted, clustering really is in the eye of the beholder. There are many types of clustering models, including connectivity models, centroid-based models, distribution models, density models, group models, and graph-based models. So when we're thinking about clustering, you know, it's not like, okay, I have a clustering task, therefore I'm just going to grab this, you know, my cluster tool out of my tool pool. We have to look at the task at hand, see the spread of the data, run our algorithms, and then make assessments of whether or not, you know, our clustering approach makes sense. So the diagnostics in this case are really very important to creating effective clusters. Now, a clustering is essentially a set of such clusters usually containing all objects in the data set. 
Additionally, it may specify the relationship of the clusters to each other. For example, a hierarchy of clusters embedded in each other. Clusterings can be roughly distinguished as hard clustering, which is essentially saying each object belongs to a specific cluster or it doesn't. Or soft clustering, which is also known as fuzzy clustering, basically the edges of the clusters are blurred a little bit. Again, each object belongs to each cluster to a certain degree. You know, think of the, an electron cloud on an atom for those uh, uh, quantum physicists out there. You know, there's their probability distri distributions. It's not like a very concrete outer shell of exactly, you know, where an electron has to be. It's, it's fuzzy in a sense. I'd like to now talk about um, one specific clustering algorithm called the K-means cluster. It is one of the simplest unsupervised learning algorithms that solve the well-known clustering problem. It's when you're working with clustering, k-means most certainly will be one of your go-to tools. And the algorithm is composed of the following steps. You place k points into the space represented by the objects that are being clustered. Okay, and these points represent the initial group centroids. You assign each object to the group that has the closest centroid. When all objects have been assigned, recalculate the positions of the k-centroids. Repeat steps 2 and 3 until the centroids no longer move. The k-means algorithm does not necessarily find the most optimal configuration corresponding to the global objective function minimum. Okay, so what is this actually telling us? If we look at our example here, uh, we have to pick a point where we say, okay, we're going to create three clusters, in a sense. And in this case, we have red, blue, and green. So we pick one point arbitrarily, and we say, this is the red one. Then we pick another one, and we say, this is the blue one. And then maybe further away, we pick the green one. And then we start assigning points that are close to each one of these clusters to the clusters, until there's like a clean break that's made between the clusters. Then, then we go through the process over and over and try to shift where that centroid exists until the point in which no more points are shifting between one cluster or the other. Okay, and that's, that's essentially the idea behind the K-means cluster. Okay. Now, this algorithm is significantly sens sensitive to the initial randomly se selected cluster centers. Okay, so that is one of the, the drawbacks of the K-means cluster. Okay, so when it chooses the initial centroid, it is sensitive um, to its initial starting position. What we have talked about in the K-means cluster, in this case, our example, we use three, three clusters. Well, how did I know to use three? Why not four or five? Uh, this is a, a, a common problem that we're going to run into. And I'd like to talk about a way that we can go about making this assessment. A screen plot is a graphical display of the variance of each cluster component to the data set, which is used to determine how many components should be retained in order to explain a high percentage of the variation in the data. The variance of each component is calculated with the following for formula. And the plot shows the variance for the first component and then for the subsequent components, and then it shows the additional variance that each component is adding. Well, screen plot is sometimes referred to as an elbow plot. And if you brought in the simple picture of a, of a human arm, okay, and it was showing you know, the bend in the arm where the elbow is. And it's very similar to the screen plot. If you look at the screen plot, you see it kind of mimics that shape a little bit. 
So in order to identify the optimal number of clusters, we need to look for the bend at the elbow. And where that bend exists is where we want to create our cluster. Okay. In this example, we see a cluster of three or four, depending on how you want to look at it, uh, has kind of the optimal bend. But I will then go ahead and say use three. So there we go. There's another interesting plot that we can use. It's called a silhouette plot. Okay. And a silhouette refers to a method of interpretation in the validation of clusters of data. So imagine the shadow or silhouette, if you will, of a human being. So in this, this example, I'm just showing just you know, a gray shadow. And here is what a silhouette plot looks like. Okay. And the silhouette technique provides a succinct graphical representation of how well each object lies within its cluster. And it was first described by Peter J. Uh, <laughs> Lucivu in 1986. Sorry, sorry, Peter, if I just butchered your name there. But this is showing us for the four clusters how the spread of the point fit within the uh, within each cluster and overall. It's a very useful plot. And it does kind of in this way, you know, look like a silhouette. The goal of the silhouette plot is to identify the point with the highest average silhouette width or ASW. Okay. This is the optimal number of clusters for the analysis. So when we actually see a plot, in this case, um, we have on the vertical axis the uh, ASW in different ranges and the component numbers or number of clusters on the horizontal axis. So we're looking for the highest point in this case. And what we see is that four would be the optimal number of clusters. So we go ahead and we select that, and then that becomes our parameter for our cluster analysis. Back to our k-means algorithm. The cluster plot shows the spread of the data within each of the generated clusters. A principal component analysis, which is greater than two dimensions, can be utilized to view the cluster. So if I'm looking at the principal component analysis, uh, which is just showing it in a two-dimensional space of the two components, we can see the, where the points fall within each one of these clusters. And if we want to look at a cluster plot, these visual shapes that we're seeing, the red circle, the green, the blue, and the purple circles, are just kind of showing where data points are falling within each cluster and the size of these clusters. So there are many types of graphical plots that we can look at to just kind of see how our data points are falling within the clusters. And these are all readily available in the R program. Here is an example of K-means clustering based on the Ruspin data. So if I'm looking at this data here, before we understand the clustering, to me it looks like there are four packets of data. So I mean, we could argue that there are five because there's kind of like this middle, or maybe even six. It just, just depends on your point of view. But, but I see, just at a, at a very broad glance, I see, I see four distinct packets of, of data points. So if we use a cluster of four, we can run our, our plus plot, our principal component plot, and we can kind of visualize the, the distribution of these data points. And then we can apply the clusters back to our original set of data. When we apply it, in the R language, it's showing us just through color coding where each point are falling within each cluster. So as we had talked about, we, we specify that there are four clusters by looking at the data. And then we did some evaluation of our plot. And in this, and then the outcome is a representation of the points based off of what we had seen. Now let's shift gears and let's talk about hierarchical clustering for a moment. 
hierarchical clustering outputs a hierarchy, which is a structure that is more informative than the unstructured set of clusters returned by flat clustering. So when we had created our k-means cluster, you know, they're just data points on a graph, and then they're just circles kind of surrounding them, saying this point belongs to this cluster, this point belongs to that. Well, what if we have products with performance characteristics, and we want to see clusters within clusters, if you will. And that's essentially what a hierarchical cluster does, is it creates a dendrogram which shows these relationships at a very high level. And then as we're drilling down, much like our decision trees, we get into deeper and deeper layers. And we can see how, uh, how different data points fall within certain clusters in this sense. Okay. Hierarchical clustering does not require us to pre-specify the number of clusters. And most hierarchical algorithms that have been used in information retrieval are deterministic. These advantages of hierarchical clustering come at the cost of lower efficiency. Okay, so, cluster, you know, hierarchical clustering is good in uh, certain circumstances, but it has drawbacks in others. Given a set of n items to be clustered and an n by n distance or similarity matrix, the basic process for Johnson's hierarchical clustering is this. Start by assigning each item to its own cluster so that you have n items, you now have n clusters, each containing just one item. Let the distances or the similarities between the clusters equal the distances or similarities between the items that they contain. Then you find the closest or most similar pair of clusters and merge them into a single cluster so that you have one less cluster compute the distance and similarities between the new cluster and each of the old clusters. Then you repeat the steps 2 and 3 until all items are clustered into a single cluster of size n. So in this case we have four main cluster branches, but if you start all the way at the bottom and then you work your way up the dendrogram, you will find that you're getting from layers of more complexity to simpler layers. And depending on how you look at this, in this case, we're looking at a certain level of depth and we're saying there's four clusters. But then you can even say above that, there are only two clusters. And then they all sit in one grand cluster at the top. And that's really at the heart of how hierarchical clustering works. Now step three can actually be done in different ways, which is what distinguish, distinguishes single linkage from complete linkage and average linkage clustering. So there are even different variants of hierarchical clustering depending on how you want to calibrate the parameters. Okay. In single link, linkage clustering, we consider the distance between one cluster and another cluster to be equal to the shortest distance from any member of one cluster to any member of the other cluster. In complete linkage clustering, on the other hand, we consider the distance between one cluster and another cluster to be equal to the greatest distance from any member of one cluster to any member of the other cluster. And finally, in average linkage clustering, we consider the distance between one cluster and another cluster to be equal to the average distance from any one member of one cluster to any member of the other cluster. Well, here is an example of hierarchical clustering based on the Ruspini data. So much like before, we have our Ruspini data set, our four clusters that we had looked at. We apply our hierarchical clustering algorithm with a cluster of a depth of four. And then finally, when we map these points, we see that the relationships are also the same as what we had with k-means. So both techniques got us to the same point, created four clusters, we calibrated it uh, you know, using our screen plot in very similar ways, but two different techniques can get you to the same outcome.
I would like to talk a little bit about a more advanced model, or I, I wouldn't say more advanced, I mean each algorithm has its strengths and weaknesses, but a, a different clustering approach. And another technique that we can use for clustering, it involves the application of the EM algorithm for Gaussian mixed models. The approach, it uses the MCLUST package in R and it utilizes the BIC statistic as the measurement criteria. Okay. And the goal for this cluster is to maximize the BIC. And this approach is considered to be a fuzzy clustering method. So before we, the techniques are have very firm cutoffs in terms of where points fall within one cluster. This is of a different class of clustering methods. And I think you can see based off the image here that it's much like our electron orbiting the, the nucleus of an atom, that we have fuzzy shells, if you will. So the further you get out, the less likelihood an item is going to be falling within a particular cluster. Here are some diagnostics which are useful to establish the correct fit for the data. So we're going to go back to our original data set. If I put the Rusmini data set and run a diagnostic on it, we see that based off of the number of components, we're trying to maximize the BIC. So this diagnostic plot shows us that the cluster of five should be used. Okay, and that's, so just by looking, we find the points in which the highest BIC exists, and therefore, once we have that, we say, okay, well, the number of components in this case is five, therefore our cluster should be five. And this is different because in our previous examples, we were only looking at four. And what's nice about Gaussian mixed models and the M class classification is that we see the centroid as represented in the chart on the left hand side as a little x in the middle of the circle. Okay. And we see all five of them in this case. So notice our cluster on the right hand side, which used to be one cluster in the other algorithms, now those three square dots have formed their own cluster. So they aren't close enough to the other cluster to be you know, considered four, then the algorithm said yeah, I think these are unique enough. Let's let's consider them you know, part of their own uh, unique cluster. The chart on the right hand side actually is an uncertainty chart. So the smaller the dots, the more certain they are. But the larger the dots that they have, the less certain that they are, uh, belonging to one versus the other. So this is a, a really interesting diagnostic that you can use when you're doing clustering techniques. And if you want to get into the Gaussian mixed model approach um, to kind of showcase you know, how you derive your clusters. And another approach that we can take on top of it is a contour plot. And what the contour plot is actually, it shows the density of the data points relative to each one of the centroids. And this is like a topological chart, if you will. And you can see kind of the waves and ripples in this case where you see uh, the, the main clusters kind of sit in the, in the big circles, but we can see kind of the ridges and where the waves form. So just another interesting image that you can use in, uh, in your cluster uh, diagnostics. Now we're going to talk a little bit about distance and similarity matrices. So we've been talking about diagnostics of clusters, and since it's, it's more of an art than a science, I want to show some interesting visuals that help us when working with, uh, with clustering techniques. So a similarity matrix is a matrix of scores that represent the similarity between a number of data points. Each element of the similarity matrix contains a measure of similarity between two of the data points. A distance matrix is a matrix, a two-dimensional array, if you will, containing the distances taken pairwise of a set of points. 
This matrix will have a size of n by n, where n is the number of points, nodes, or vertices, and it's often in a graph. So getting into the idea a little more, I, I know looking at the previous example it wasn't very clear what that graph had mentioned. Imagine if I'm looking at a graph and I have all these various points that sit on a graph. Okay, so A, B, C, D, E, and F. A distance matrix is actually going to calculate the different the distance between each one of these points. Okay, and as it's calculating the the distance between the points, and it formulates it into a matrix. Then from that matrix, it creates a heat map. In this case, our heat map is a very simple gray scale one. It just kind of shows the relative distance. Previously, we had one that almost looked like the surface of the sun. Okay. And in some of the upcoming examples, we'll see some heat maps that are in the gray scale that just kind of show what's going on. But Pay very close attention to this particular slide and how those points on a graph relate to the distance matrix, which then corresponds to a heat map. Because once you understand that concept, then when you start to see these other metrics come into play and how to interpret these other graphs, it will make a little more sense and you'll have some pretty cool visuals to show uh, when working uh, with clustering. Okay, let's take a look at some. So here is an application of the distance matrix to that Ruspini data set that we've been looking at in this case. So the ones that had the four clusters in our k-means, it had four clusters in our hierarchical clustering, and our Gaussian mix, mix model had five. But let's, let's apply the distance matrix. And here is the distance matrix in grayscale, if you will. So when you're looking at all the different data points, when, when I'm looking at this, I see no real discernible pattern. I may see a couple dark blotches here and there. Uh, it's not really a particularly useful chart for me. Now what we're going to do is we're going to reorder the distance matrix by the k-means algorithm. So we're going to apply k-means in this case, and then once we've applied k-means, we're going to see if we see pockets of information that you know, uh, brings a little more order to this chaos. So let's just see what we come up with. Ah, that's much nicer. And looking at this, I can tell that this is a 4x4 four four, uh, block of information. I can see all the black dots in the middle uh, going across a di diagonal make sense. Okay. Some blocks are a little bigger than others, but color and grayscale, relative grayscale, compared to the original distance matrix and what we've applied on our k-means seems to be relatively symmetric. And because it's symmetric and looks looks good in this case, I would venture to say that a k equaling 4 matches this data very well. And we'll see, some, we'll see an example in which the data doesn't match well, and you'll see what the difference is very clearly when you look at this. But when we apply the k-means and take a look at the resulting image, we have something uh, which is visually aesthetic. And that's how we know we've got a cluster that, that looks pretty good. Okay, now we bring in the this, this plot to compare the heat map against the expected values. Okay. So we have what we had put from our clustering algorithm against the expected values. And what we're looking for here now is symmetry across um, the split of the diagonals in this case. Okay. So this graph really kind of shows even more the, the difference in the grayscale. So the grayscale colors that we see on the lower side of the diagonal are more of a uniform gray color. Okay, But we see some that are black, like a charcoal black, we see some lighter and we compare these to our observed values on the other side. And are we seeing the right color patterns? Do they look relatively similar to each other? And from my observations, I would say, I would say yes. These are uh, very useful. Okay. 
Now here is an example where we specify k is equal to 3 instead of k equals 4. And I wanted to show an example of a misspecification because when you see this, we don't have that beautiful symmetry anymore. If you look at the dissimilarity plot, we see that it just it doesn't make sense. In that upper left hand corner, we have what appears to be a charcoal black, or like not quite the darkest black that we have, um, a very dark gray. But then when we look at our observed values, we see two triangles of charcoal black, and then we see a gray a rectangle in the same area that we would expect to see just one really dark area. And that's representing points that are being incorrectly specified from our clustering. Okay. And this gives us a clue that they should actually be separated into their own distinct cluster. And I think that these plots are incredibly powerful visual aids when evaluating the fit of clusters. So when we're going about doing our clustering work, you know, create our screes, create our silhouette plots, uh, you know, create our heat maps, create our distance matrix like this, and then once you've gone through that entire technique, you can feel one that you've identified clusters that make sense, but then you have you know, um, the metrics and the visuals to back it up. I now would like to walk into the example um, where we're going to get into some multiple clustering techniques. Before we can begin working with clustering, let's take a look at our data set. And the goal of a clustering exercise should be to identify the appropriate pockets or groups of data that should be grouped together. So it's not like you were making a prediction in this case. It's it's creating the number of clusters that make sense to the data that we're observing. So as we're going through our EDA, and if clustering is going to be part of you know, our EDA where we want to create some hierarchies, then how do we know that we have the right number of clusters? And does it, does it match the data? Okay. And because the structure of this underlying data is usually unknown, there can be many different clusters created by many different clustering techniques. So we're going to explore a couple different techniques, and then we're going to identify the cluster that makes the most sense. So therefore, we're going to use a data set where it is absolutely obvious what the correct number of clusters should be. And we're just going to see the performance of these clusters. Well, here is our data set. I don't think I have to explain what we're looking at here. But this is a this is a happy piece of data. Most importantly, when I'm looking at this, I see four clusters. I see two eyes, a nose, and a mouth. Now the question is, can we use our algorithms and see what uh, what our diagnostics show and what we come up with? So without further ado, let's let's take a look. We'll first start off with our k-means cluster. So we'll first run the, the clustering algorithm, and we'll generate our screed plot. In this case, the screed plot actually shows us that at the bend of the elbow that it lies on 5 and 6. Uh, I would, in this example, use 6, because that's the point just after the bend. And that's generally where we want to go with the cluster. Well, when I look at the result of this work, we can see that it produces too many clusters based off the data set. It gets both eyes correct. It gets the nose correct. And what's interesting is it takes the bend of the mouth and actually splits it up into three distinct clusters. Okay. But in general, it's, it doesn't look like it performed very well. Now we'll take a look and we'll use uh, the hierarchical clustering method. In this example, we'll base our metric off the silhouette plot. Okay. And 
in this example, the silhouette plot using the average silhouette width has identified the k should be 4. And now when we see our clustering algorithm, we see a nice happy face. Okay, two eyes, a nose, and a mouth. Exactly what I would expect. So here is the same data set. We've used two different techniques, two different clustering uh, calibration mechanisms. We found one didn't fit the data well. On the other hand, uh, the hierarchical clustering algorithm fit the data very well. Okay, and we used our silhouette plot to help guide us to that. So the conclusion from this exercise should be uh, you have to take different tools and apply it to this task. Look at the data, make sure it makes sense. And as long as you have the right data and the right spread of the points of the data that you can look at, um, choose your clustering algorithms, run the metrics, and find the right fit. Thank you very much, everyone, for tuning in to this presentation. I enjoyed spending my time with you, and if you enjoyed this series, subscribe to, uh, to my YouTube channel and check out some of the other ones. Okay, thank you very much.